eternal Father, for the sake of the death and resurrection of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Not turning back. Praise God. Hallelujah. Have you decided to follow Jesus? Eh? Okay, so today, the Bible or the readings remind us about our followership of Jesus, of God. Matter of factly, any path you decide to follow in life, there are basic fundamental things that are necessary for you to succeed, then there are other things you must overcome if you must succeed. There are things you must do to succeed, and there are things you must overcome to succeed. In fact, that's the difference between Elisha in the first reading and the three people in the gospel. Whether you are called or you are the one who choose to follow, there are things you must do. Elisha represents those who successfully and <clears throat> faithfully follow. So when Elijah came, God said to Elijah, go and anoint Elisha to succeed you. Elijah came, threw his cloak on Elisha. He didn't say anything. And Elisha said, hold on one minute, let me do something. And Elijah said to him, what's my business? Did I do anything to you? It means that Elisha understood the prophetic action of Elijah. If you must keep your sanity in this present generation of religious intoxication, you must learn to distinguish prophetic action from ordinary um, drama. Okay? Then, Elisha went and slaughtered the animals he was using for his business. He was <clears throat> an agriculturist, or call him an agro-allied businessman. He slaughtered them. And the Bible says, he gave it to all his men to eat, scattered his farming equipment, used it as food to cook the animals. Then, he followed Elijah and became his servant. Then, the three persons here, the first person volunteered. He said, Lord, I want to follow you. Jesus said, foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Did you hear anything from the guy again? Did he follow? No. He was not successful. The second guy, Jesus said, follow me. The guy said, let me first go and do what? bury my father. Jesus said, leave the dead to bury their dead. He did not succeed. He didn't follow. The third one said, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me go and say goodbye to, my, to the people in my home. Jesus said, no one who puts his hand on the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let me ask your neighbor, are you fit for the kingdom of God? Thought somebody say, are you fit for the kingdom of God? <clears throat> You know, you follow into the kingdom. You follow into the kingdom. You don't just disappear. You must follow into the kingdom. So, so there are two groups of followers. The Elisha group, who successfully 
and fruitfully follow. Then these are the three groups. So what do we call these ones who didn't succeed? What do we call them? So we have the Elisha group. Let's call this other one Shisha group. Everybody say Shisha. You know Shisha now? Many of them are the smoker. You cannot tell lies. You have the Elisha group. You have the Shisha group. You know Shisha? That thing you smoke in. Uh, some of you, sm you have them in your houses. Some of you have them. Don't deny. You smoke, you inhale. Shisha is that smoke you get. I don't know from where you put into your... Uh, body, you know, it has no vitamins, no mineral, no nutritional, no biological, no psychological, no spiritual, no emotional value. But people still take it. So, <clears throat> the group of believers who follow like Elisha, they are the Elisha followers. Those who have one reason or the other, why they do not follow successfully. They are the Shisha group. So let me ask your neighbor, are you in the Elisha or in the Shisha group? Which one? <laughs> we have Shisha Christians. We have Shisha prophets all over the place. Praise God. So the question is going to be, what made Elisha successful in following? So to follow faithfully to the end, two things you must do then three things you must avoid or overcome. Two things you must do. Number one is decision. Everybody say decision. Everybody say decision. There is nothing in this life you can begin or achieve without making decision. You must decide. The day you wake up in the morning and you don't decide to stand from the bed, you cannot get up, even though you are awake. To get up from the bed is a decision. There are some things we are not doing now because we have not decided until you decide, you cannot start anything. So decision is very, very important. You must decide. And as far as following the Lord is concerned, it is when you make decision to follow. That's why I said, I have decided to follow Jesus. When you make decision to follow, that's when temptations will come. Your temptations in life are, if you want, congruent to your decisions. The temptations you experience are going to be according to what kind of decisions you have made in life. So, Sirach chapter 2, verse, uh, from verse, verses 1 and 2, say, My son, when you make up your mind, the day you decide to serve God, get ready for what? Trials, temptations, difficulties. Praise God. Are you hearing? The day you decide to serve God, he say. Prepare them for trials. So, that's why Jesus said, anyone who wishes to be a follower of mine must do what? I'm going ahead of myself. Renounce himself. Then do what? Take up what? Take up what? Take up what? His cross and do what? You can't follow him without doing those two things, renouncing himself and taking the cross. The cross is symbolic of trials. Can you see that there is a changing face of Christianity? We are given the impression that your troubles will stop the day you become a Christian. But the Bible is saying it is the day you make up your mind to follow that temptations will begin to come. Matter of fact, those who have not made decisions, they are not having temptation. Those who don't make decisions, they are not having temptation. There are some people who are not tempted by fornication. Fornication is not a temptation to them. Do you know why? They are living and sleeping in fornication. You are living with your, what do you call them, your partners. They, you sleep and wake up with them. So, Tem uh, fornication is not a temptation to you because you are living in it. In fact, what is a temptation to you is purity. Sometimes you come to church, Father preaches about purity and you are scared. Oh, your problem is, so I will leave this one and start doing this one. You, you, temptation is not a fornication to you because you have not decided to embrace the life of sexual purity. It's the day you make a decision that you are going to be pure. That's when you begin to see temptation. Because our people say, person where they for granted, no, they fear to do what? To fall. 
Some men, adultery is not, it's not a temptation to them. Some married men or married women, adultery is not a temptation. Why? They are living in it. Uh, it's not a temptation. You, are, you, you, sleep, you sleep in it. You wake up. So it's not a temptation. It is an indulgence. Indulgence is something you have imbibed, permitted, and you are at home with. You live in it. Yes. So there are two kinds of Christians. There are those who are tempted and there are those who are indulgent. And like I said, your temptation will depend on your decision. There are some men to hit their wife is a big temptation to them. Why? Because the day they married, they decided they will never, under any circumstance, lift their hands against their wife. And so to hit their wife is a temptation because, of course, women know how to provoke men. I uh, don't know whether it's part of their gifts from Garden of Eden. So, but for these men who made a vow, Father, I made a vow, I will never raise my hand against my wife. May God continue to sustain them in the name of Jesus. God. Hitting their wife is a big temptation and they are scared of it. But for some men, for where it's not a temptation to them. It's a normal routine. It's a hobby. Their wives are they are punching bags. Eh? A, a domestic boxer. It's only your wife's body you know how to practice how to. But it's not a temptation because it's your indulgence. You indulge in it. That means you do it rascally all the time. You've not made the decision. The people of Israel in Joshua 24... Idolatry was not a temptation. It was an indulgence. They were doing it with reckless abandon. Then Joshua now had to call them and say, my friends, all your time has come. We must decide today. Then he said, choose you whom you will serve. Whether you are going to serve God, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who brought you from the land of Egypt, or you are going to worship these other gods. You can't combine the two. Choose one. The day... They made that decision that they were going to serve God. That's when they now started facing real temptation of idolatry. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. So you don't know what temptation is until you've made a decision about something. You decide now that you're going to be working out for health reasons. The temptation some days not to go will be there. But for some people, the temptation not to go and exercise is not there. Why? They know they do them at all. Eat, digest, accumulate, sleep, get hungry. Eat, digest, accumulate, sleep, get hungry. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Oh. Hallelujah. So your temptation is congruent to your decision. So what decision have you made? When you decide to follow Jesus, your temptation will come. You will see it. Anywhere. Anything you make a decision to do, temptation not to do that thing will now become the next thing. Okay? Then the next thing is determination. Everybody say determination. determination. Say determination. determination. When you make your decisions, the temptations will come in. The next thing that will pull you is what? Determination. You have to be determined. To get to that destination, to follow the Lord faithfully, you must be determined against the things that are coming your way. You must be determined, okay? But let me warn you, both decision and determination are not enough. The same decision Elijah, Elisha made was the same decision the first man who said, Lord, I want to follow you, made. Was the same decision the second person made when Jesus said, follow me. Was also the same decision that the third person made when he said, I will follow you, but let me go back. Everybody makes decision. All of them made decision. So to begin, there must be decision. So decision is not the problem. Why Elisha succeeded, they did not decide. Determination. They too were determined to follow the Lord, just like Elisha was. Peter was determined when he said to Jesus in John chapter 13, he said, even if these other ones desert you, I will not. I will follow and die with you. He was determined and he meant it and he was honest 
about it. But Jesus laughed and said to him, this guy, he don't know human nature. Before the call crows, you would have done what? You would have denied me three times. So it wasn't like Peter was not decided or determined um, not to follow the Lord through. But there is something else that came the way. Sometimes people fail not because they are not determined. Sometimes your husband hurts you, your wife hurts you, or even Jesus, you not because they are not determined. I need you to pay attention to that. So even though it takes decision and determination to succeed in any chosen area or mission or whatever, they are not enough. Don't stop there. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Even determined people can fail. But you can never succeed if you are not determined. But you can still not succeed even if you are determined. It takes much more than that. Okay, so to follow the Lord, we must make the decision and we must be determined. To love your wife as Christ loved the church, you must make the decision. Not because you are hearing Father saying, you must take the decision. You will wake up one day yourself and sit yourself and say, from today I have decided to love my wife the way Christ loved the church and I will be determined I will be determined. Then when you do this, the next thing is to face these major three um, obstacles all of us face, which we read from that first man. When you face down, what is the first one? The first obstacle is, I will follow you, Lord. Then Jesus said, foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay, he said, and the guy fizzled out. Shisha. Smoke blew away. Why? He had his own expectations of what following Jesus is or should be. The first thing after you made decision and you are determined is to look at your expectations. All of us like the Bible that says the expectations of the righteous shall not be disappointed and all of that but what we forget is that sometimes the expectations of the righteous might not be in congruence with God's will or might be at variance with God's will he had his own expectation what was his expectation? comfort, luxury that's what holes and necks mean what Jesus is saying, see Forces have holes. That means they have homes where they can go and relax. Bears have nests where they can go. But the other man has nowhere. That means this walk, if they carry me, they go up and down. Sometimes I don't even have time to sleep. So no time for personal comfort and stuff like that. So if you want to follow me, I need you to know that this is what you should expect. But unfortunately, the man had a different expectation. First thing to deal with is your expectation. One of the perennial problems of Christianity today is expectations. The expectations of the righteous shall not be disappointed. I have told you before, God they disappoint expectations well. God is an expert in disappointing expectations. He they disappoint. Praise God. <laughs> this gospel, you people will know. Hear me very well. God is an expert in disappointment. You know, the Amaka they disappoint self. God they disappoint well, well. Write it down in your heart. In case you don't know, till tomorrow, there are less than 2% Christians among Jews. Jesus told the Samaritan woman, He said, Salvation came from the Jews. But till tomorrow, less than 2% of Jews. Flesh and blood of Jesus are Christians. Do you know why? The major reason. I have told you before. Jesus Christ, who was supposed to be the Messiah, disappointed their expectations. The thief on the cross verbalized it. Are you not the Christ? If you are the one, save yourself now. Come down from the cross and save us. Huh? Save us from the Romans. They have occupied our land. We are like a slave to them. They determine 
What happens in Alana? You say you are the Messiah. The Messiah they are waiting for is the Messiah that will ride in glory with military power, flush out all of the enemies, these unbelievers who are imposing taxes on them, and establish Israel as the most powerful nation in the world. Jesus did not do that. They had a Messiah who was instead of blowing wind so that breeze will carry all the soldiers of the Romans away. It's the same Jesus that is telling them when somebody slaps you on one cheek, turn the other. So all these slaps we have been receiving is not enough for us that we have to turn the cheek again. They were bitterly disappointed in case you don't know. What is your expectation in following Jesus? So what? There is nothing wrong with keep your expectation, your good expectations, no problem. You have it. Everybody has their expectation in coming to church, including me, all of us have. Keep it. Okay? But remember, remember that sometimes, if not most times, God's action or God's will may be at variance with your expectation. And when you discover that, what do you do? When Jesus told the man, he discovered that his expectation isn't going to align especially with what God wants. He left. Question is, what when what you expect is not what God is willing to give to you? Will you still follow? Help me ask your neighbor. You go still follow? Help me ask your neighbor. You go still follow? When you are expecting nests and holes and God has not made provision for that, will you still follow? This first person represents all of us. I can assure you more than 90% of why we are following God, Jesus, coming to church, believing in Christ, is because we believe that through God we shall get the things we are looking for. All of us. And I said to the people in the first mass, if God removes hell now, how many of us will see they come to church? Let's even go from eternity angle. If by some Jesus just appears and says, okay, we have had a council meeting in heaven. And uh, we decided to vote. Me and Holy Spirit voted against the Father, two against one. Let's cancel hell. There is no hell again. How many of you are going to come to church? Because in the recent of it, the foundation to serving God in spirit and in truth wasn't the fear of hell. Was it even the reward of heaven? It's Matthew 22. You shall love the Lord your God with what? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the foundation. It's love. If we don't serve God out of love, we are serving him out of fear or needs. And anyone who serves God basically, fundamentally, out of fear or needs cannot follow faithfully. That's what makes us shisha Christians. Or if you now get to know that you don't need to come to church, and I preach this gospel before, it's very dangerous. If you now get to realize that you don't need to come to church, you don't need to believe in God, you don't need to believe in Christ to have the things you are looking for, how many of you will still come to church? Many of us are here because somehow you are afraid that if you don't worship God, that promotion you are looking for, God will sabotage it. There is a fear that if you don't worship God, these good things in life you are looking for, you will not get it. It's what is driving many of us. When you are convinced to discover that you don't need to believe in God, be a Christian, come to church, tight, do bazaar and all the things we do. Before you can get all of the nice things in life you are looking for. How many of us will come to church? Many of us are here today because of what we think God will do for us. And I've told you before. I have told you before. God is not transactional. You honestly don't have to believe in God. I am not discouraging you. <laughs> you honestly don't have to be in church to have those good things. Because Matthew 5, Jesus makes it clear. The blessing of God is for all humanity. God is not petty. God is not in need of people in heaven so much that he has to bribe us with a car, bribe you with a house, bribe you with a wife or husband so that you can serve him and come to heaven. For where? That's not God. All of us here, most of us, the reason we come to church, and many false gospels have made it very loud and clear. Many of us, is the mentality of, carry me, they go. 
Jesus, carry me, they go. My husband house, carry me, they go. The day where you will learn, say, no, be Jesus, they carry person, go husband house. You go come church. <laughs> Praise God. This is part of the problem of the Western world. The Western world used to be more pious than we are. We never even see pious. We never even see pious. The, the, the faith came to us when many people have you know, undergone what you may call a formal education. They were more pious than we are. But when they kept advancing in science and technology, they discovered that you don't need to go and say, help Mary, our father, before you become rich, before you have this and that. That's when they started doing what? Going down. The things you pray in Africa and Nigeria especially to get, you don't need prayer then. Oh, yes, that's the truth. But I want to quickly add, anybody who thinks that God is only needed for material things, then the person has not sat down to meditate on life. The person doesn't know what the real blessing is. But let me keep talking about us. The things we pray for here, they are readily available there now. That means many of us, the reasons you come to church here, if you are transported now to America or to Canada, those reasons will not exist. Then on Sunday morning, you will develop waste pain. I don't know if you go to church today, waste they pay me. How is not going to pay you when food day? You don't need to fast and pray before food will come. Hello, Shisha Christians. We fool everywhere, both on the altar. From the poopy down to the pew. Shisha Christian. We fool everywhere. The visa you are praying for. In Nigeria, I have said, when you get visa to go to America or UK or Canada, it's not a miracle. Some churches even organize visa crusade. You get it. You come and give testimony. But citizens of Canada, US, UK, Dubai, they are begging them. Nigeria government is begging them to come and collect your own visa. But you, you are praying to get their own visa. What is miracle for you is nonsense to them. It's given. Hello. What is your expectation? You must interrogate your expectations in following God. Interrogate them. You can have your expectations, but you must interrogate them. When God begins to talk to you and you discover that your expectations are at variance with what, God, what God's will is, it is then decision determination is also put into serious tests. Would you go further? The same thing with us priests. I want to talk about ministries. I don't want to even go there. Just, let me just tell you. So ask yourself. Ask yourself. If you remove all these material expectations you have, if you discover that you don't need to come to church, go to crusade to have these things, would you still follow? So there are those who are not following when they discover that either they are not getting those expectations or God has made it very clear to them that I'm not going to give you these expectations. They are not following like that man. Or sometimes we are like, sometimes we are like this man. Our gusto, our excitement and passion in following Jesus depends on the depth of the material expectations that we are having. So that's why tithing became an, a more important doctrine in our generation than forgiveness. Because tithing was sold as the shortest cut to what? To financial prosperity. Now that we have made people know that even giving evidence, you don't need to pay tithes to prosper. Tithe was not, God did not tell people of Israel to pay tithe so that they can prosper. No, that was not the primary reason for tithing. Now that many people have learned, do you know how many have stopped paying tithes? <laughs> it's a good thing to pay tithes. But people were paying with the wrong 
mindset. So you overcome your expectations that are at variance with the Lord's will. Then you follow. The second one, Jesus says, follow me. He said, let me go and do what? Bury my father. Now, it was not like his father was dead that time or sick. It's a cultural thing among the Jews that every child should give his father a befitting burial. So, following Jesus means he may not even be there when his father will die. You didn't know? Following Jesus means that Jesus may even send him now to a place where he will never come back until the next 50 years. And before he comes back, his father will die. So what is actually telling Jesus, wait, when my father dies and I bury him, then I'll follow you. And that death may be in the next 20 years, maybe in the next 30, maybe in the next 40. This temptation for us is procrastination. When we want something to happen first before we can do what the Lord is asking us to do, we procrastinate. And the problem is when you procrastinate, sometimes God lays something in your heart. You are convinced that this is what you should do. You say, okay, you did, but then you tell yourself, okay, wait, wait, wait. From that waiting, what will happen? It will go out of your heart completely. Maybe you decided you are going to help somebody who is in need. You say you will do this, but there is money you expect. You have the money to do this, but no. There's another money I'm expecting. You keep postponing until that time comes and goes. Procrastination. Don't procrastinate. They say, as it they hot. As it they what? Hot. Do it. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Then the third one is, let me, I'll, I'll follow you, but let me go and say goodbye. Jesus, anyone who puts his hand on the plan, looks back, is not fit for the kingdom of God. Meaning that do not let the past sabotage your present or your future. This third person is all of us. When we allow the things we left behind to follow the Lord, to still attract us, distract us so much that we want to go back to them. That is what they mean by looking back. They say forward ever, backward never. When you have made a decision and you are determined, don't look back. Saul, I mean Lot's wife looked back. What happened to her? She became what? A pillar of salt. Salt where we know if each other, poisonous salt. Sometimes the things we have left behind to follow Jesus still attract us. They still entice us. And we go back to them. This is we in that third person. So it means that when you have decided, look forward, keep going. Don't let the things you have left behind to distract you. You are married. But you still fantasize, romanticize your bachelorhood days. You still look back those days when you were a bachelor and you are loving it, you are romantic. In fact, some of you are still craving your bachelorhood life. That's why you don't give much attention to your marriage. You are married. You remember that when you were not married, you would go out, come back sometimes 1.30 a.m. Who will question you for where, you know, and all of that. Now you are married. You want to go, come back by 1.30 a.m. Then you don't want anybody to question. Your wife will ask you, why are you coming from where are you coming from by this time? And then, come on, get out. Who are you talking to? Who are you to question me? You see, the problem is you are trying to look back to when you were what? A bachelor. And you are bringing the past bachelorhood life into what? The present reality of marriage. No, you're married. You cannot go out of the house and come back anytime. You don't need permission from your wife to go out, but you need courtesy to tell her where you are going. Your wife must know where you are going to. Why do some men find it offensive when you are going and your wife saying, oh, honey, where are you going to? Why are you asking me? Your wife, your husband has to know where you are going to and when you are coming back. If you have to come back late, if there is any legitimate reason why you must come back late, you must take permission from your wife. You tell her, today there is going to be this, this, that. I will come back very late. It's, it's, it's... I don't want to call it courtesy. It's Christ-like. 
Praise God. You should. Same thing with the wife. Because you are no longer single, you are married. So, we go to confession on Saturday, receive communion on Sunday, between Monday and Friday, we are attracted back to the sins we, we confess. Putting hand on the plan, looking back. So, we must rise to overcoming the things we have left behind. They will keep following us. They will keep taunting us. And we must be determined to overcome them. In uh, Philippians chapter 3 from verse um, um, I think from verse 13, St. Paul says, looking forward, I forget what is what? Behind. Pressing forward. Help me tell somebody, press forward, press forward. Tell somebody, press forward, press forward. It's a temptation for all of us. And this temptation is real for those who have actually left something. Philippians 3, from verse 7, but once I found Christ, all the things I used to consider this, I have left them. Have you left anything? What did you leave to follow Jesus? If you have not left anything, you will be pursuing the things that people have left or people are supposed to leave to follow Christ. If you don't have this temptation, it's either you have not left anything to follow Jesus or you are one of those who are pursuing the things that people have left to follow Jesus. This temptation is really for those who have honestly left things to follow Christ. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Elisha, in addition to his decision and determination, fought these three temptations, and that's why he was able to follow faithfully. But these other ones could not. So, what then is the, what then is the main difference between Elisha, or the Elisha followers and the Shishas? One thing. Can somebody tell me? One particular thing. What is it? Is the spirit talking to somebody? So we can round up. Yes. Love of Christ. Love for Christ. Even this one, they love Christ. You know, people can love it for different reasons. What is it? We mentioned the time. That we are determined. What is it? It is this. Elisha killed. But these ones didn't kill. Samak, why are you looking at me like this? The difference between Elisha followers and Shisha followers is murder, killing. If you have not killed, you cannot follow. Let me ask your neighbor, have you killed before? <laughs> Fear don't they catch you now. If you have not killed, you cannot follow, like Elisha. Elisha killed, they didn't kill. <laughs> Best man, you're looking at me. Kill your wife now, you become a priest. <laughs> if you have not killed, you cannot. When Elijah put the mantle on Elisha, Elisha said, just give me one minute. What did he do? He slaughtered his oxen. Broke the, the farming equipment, used it for firewood, cooked. Symbolic of killing. He killed that particular thing that was going to compete for God's attention in his life. Literally, he killed himself. Because his whole life was centered on those animals and the equipment was using to do his vocation. I mean, his profession. He destroyed those things. Meaning, he killed himself. You must kill the self. St. Paul calls it dying to the self. That's why Jesus says in Mark 8, listen, if you want to be a follower of mine, say you must renounce, the first thing you renounce is what? Yourself. Jesus never, you know, most times we think devil is our biggest problem. No. He never mentioned devil anywhere. The biggest enemy, the first biggest obstacle enemy to following God is the self. If you don't kill that self, that self will have wrong expectation. That self will procrastinate. That self will look back. That self, is, that self is indulgent. That self is you wanting what God does not want. And you and I know how predominant and rampant it is in our lives. So you must slaughter the self. You must kill the self. Renounce the self. Take up the cross. You must be dead to the self, the yearnings of the flesh. Romans chapter 8, 
be guided by the spirit, not the flesh. Say the flesh cannot please God. It does not want to. It is incapable. Jesus makes it very clear in Matthew chapter um, is it 26. Say the spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? Weak. Romans 12, 1 to 2. Put Romans 12, 1 to 2. Sacrifice. Killing. You literally kill the self. You numb yourself to certain things. Temptation is only successful in the areas where our appetites are still active. You and I. And until we kill the self, all these things we keep, even the devil, the devil finds ally with the self. Jesus said, the enemy has found nothing on me. Because the first thing Jesus did, and I've told you before, the first thing Jesus did before he started ministry was what? Those fasting he did for 40 days, what do you think it was for? To collect power. After the people before, it is not by fasting you collect power. Many of you don't. In fact, many of you son that when you fast, you lose completely. Physical power you no get. Spiritual power you no get. Breeze go just carry. You don't work out. Many Christians think it's through fasting that power comes. No. Before Jesus gave the apostles power and authority, he did not tell them to fast. He just gave them power and authority. Go and preach. And they went and they did it. Acts chapter 1, he said, don't go. When the Spirit comes upon you, you will do what? You will receive power. It is the Spirit that is the source of power. Fasting is a religious piety. For what? For killing the self. That's what Jesus did. That 40 days was to kill the self. Because he was now under everything that affects human beings. As a human being, he has become a human being. He's God in human flesh. So all the weaknesses of the flesh are there. So for him, not to yield to self-indulgence like every other normal human being, flesh and blood has become. He had to kill the self. That's what that 40 days fasting and prayer. It was the Holy Spirit that led him there. And that's why he could overcome the devil. So, the success of your... Praise God, though. Praise God. Are we doing good? Eh? Are we doing good? I'll round up now. How successful you are in following God, in following up the decisions you made, in making your determination work, in overcoming those three things I mentioned, is how successful you are in killing the self, numbing the self. What you have keyed your appetite for cannot be a hindrance. I use alcohol to make an example for you. There are some people now, their biggest problem in life, the biggest problem in their marriage, the biggest problem in their health, the biggest problem in their wealth is what? Alcohol. They cannot overcome the temptation of alcohol. A cold, sweating bottle of beer or champagne is their biggest weakness. The sight of it sends them the ninth cloud. No matter what it costs, they will buy it. But there are some people that alcohol means absolutely what? Nothing. The devil cannot tempt them in that area. It's not possible. Because he knows that this person is dead to it. Transfer it to other sins. Be it sexual sin, anger problem, and all of that. See James and John now. Ndimbu. The Samaritans prevented Jesus from passing through their village. What did Jesus and John do? Say, Lord, this will know the fear face. Can we call down fire from heaven to do what? Consume them. They are our enemies because the Bible says Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the point of the consummation of his mission. So that means anything that was an obstacle on his way, he should destroy it. James and John said, Lord, who are these people? We know that you can say and say, give us permission. Let us call down fire from heaven to destroy them. The Bible, Jesus rebuked them. If you know what rebuke means, Jesus was like, you understand? Where you people got the, the ministry of fire is what I don't understand. Any enemy that says I will not make it, Holy Ghost, fire, yeah, yeah. fire, burn, burn, fire, yeah, yeah. The more we preach against it, the more people are keep doing it. I'm even tired of correcting. I have told you before, God knows the burn. Even the burning bush was not even consumed. 
Now human being one compound. It's the flesh. Lack of tolerance. Anybody who is against you must be destroyed. It's not like that. So what am I saying? Elisha kid, you must kill, I must kill. That's what St. Paul imports here. Read with me, Romans 12, 1 to 2. 1 to go, everybody. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as? As what? As what? What is sacrifice? It's to kill. So discover your own obstructions. Discover your own temptation. Discover what keeps you from following the Lord. One of the ways you can overcome is by doing sacrifice, which is trying to kill the self towards that. St. Paul says in Philippians 2, from verse 19, he says, with Christ, Galatians 2, sorry, I hang on the cross. It's no longer I who live, but Christ living in me. It's crucifixion. Romans 8, kill the flesh, destroy the flesh. So that's the difference between Elisha and the Shishas. So I pray that most times we shall not be the Shishas, we shall be the Elishas. In the name of Jesus Christ. And before I conclude, let me conclude with, we also have Shisha Elijahs. Shisha Elijahs. God said to Elijah, go and anoint Elisha. If you go to the verses before 19, I mean before where we started, I think it's 1 Kings chapter 19 we are reading today. There were three people God told Elijah to anoint. Elisha to replace him. Jehu as a prophet. Then the Hazael as king. Jehu as king of Israel. And then Hazael as king of Samaria. Anointing. God did not tell Elijah, go and prophesy who will become king. He told him, go and do what? Anoint. Specifically. Who becomes president and governor? It's not by prophecy. It's by anointing. It's only Shisha Elijah that we stand on the altar with microphone and say, as I was praying, the Holy Spirit invaded me. And he has told me who is going to be the president in 2023. I prophesy, and it's this man. That person is a Shisha. I want to tell you now. Go to the scripture. When God wants to choose somebody, the prophet does not prophesy. The prophet anoints. When God um, sends Samuel to anoint Saul, did Samuel prophesy? Did he call people in the temple and prophesy? What did Samuel do? He carried his oil. Even called Saul to a private secret place. All of the anointings never took place in any public place. They were usually private, secret. Matthew chapter 6, when you want to pray, go to the secret place. Samuel anointed Saul. See, I will not say secretly, privately, not prophecy. The same Samuel, when he was to anoint David, fear catch him, he said, you saw catch me. He will do to me what they are doing today. Oh. Once you declare your intention to become president, that's when the FCC will remember that there is one cobble you did not uh, account for. He told God, God said, go and do it secretly. Where did Samuel anoint David? In his father's house. And he was going in the pretense of going to have dinner with them secretly. All the kings that were anointed... Whom God sent prophets and it was by anointing, no prophets. Where did your generation of prophets get the idea of three people are going to contest for presidents? Somebody comes and says, God reveals that this person that will become. That is not prophecy, that is a game of probability. Out of three, one person must become. That's why you have different prophets in Nigeria. Somebody will say this one, another person will say that one, another person will say this one. At the end of the day, one person will be correct. It's a game of probability. I'm telling you now because there is too much confusion. 
It's by anointing. And whoever God anoints against all odds, the person must do what? Must become. Whether the person has structure or not. Whether the person they give shishi or not. And all those God even anointed, they know they give shishi. And I'm not saying this to campaign for anybody. I'm saying this with all sense of seriousness. We are too lousy. Christians are too lousy and too noisy. We are too lousy and too noisy Christians. Every minister wants to show himself. There is no God that has revealed to you who will be a president in 2023. God does not do that. Not except you are reading a different book apart from the Bible that we are reading. We are too lousy. We Christians, lousy, noisy, petty. No thanks to the so-called men of God. What others will do quietly, planning, we will not. We will carry microphone and be talking nonsense. It's only in Christian-dominated areas that we hear men of God prophesying about who will be king, governor, or this or that. Our Muslim brothers... God bless them. In the north, elections take place. Do you hear imams prophesying that this person will be or not be? Do they not have people coming out to fill those positions? If they want to plan who to vote, they will go and do their normal political calculation. We will not do political calculation. We will come out and carry microphone and be talking nonsense. God does not prophesy. Anybody who tells you, I know why I'm telling you this, because instead of you now deciding who to vote in conscience, one man of God that you like has prophesied that this is the person. Me, why this is not the person that is in your mind to vote, but because he has said his prophecy, you now you are now afraid. Thinking that when you vote another person, you are going against God's candidate. Causing confusion everywhere. We will not plan. The same reason Christians cannot plan Politically, it is the same reason we cannot plan spiritually. We are not coordinated. We are not one. It's only when there is an election you are beginning to come and talk and behave as if we are one. We can't even regulate ourselves. We can't even regulate who is qualified to own a church or not. We can't even regulate our doctrines. We are confusionists all over the place. But when it comes to politics, we we'll come and be showing ourselves the Muslims are more mature than us in many things. And shame to Christian ministers. Big shame. And you guys should stop listening to all of this nonsense. All the prophecies that have been given to you about president. Which president has come and changed Nigeria? And let me tell you the truth you may not want to hear. In democracy, your vote is like the decision. is the first step. It's not enough. You can vote who you want. Don't stop there. It's after you have voted and the person has entered office. The real magic of democracy is how you participate in enforcing that your rulers put the right policies in place. That is where Christians can unite. Not in deciding who to vote. I don't believe in the nonsense of deciding who to vote. God, even the person God chooses can disappoint tomorrow. Is it not the same somebody that anointed Saul, that anointed David? Did Saul not mess up? So what is the big deal about prophecy who becomes president? Is the same anointing oil that was used in anointing Saul? That was used in anointing uh, David. The same oil of ordination that the bishop used for all priests. Yet some priests will come and crash a parish. Another one will come and build. Vote. Get your PVC is very important, but don't stop there. Don't stop. That's the mistake we are making. The power of democracy is not just in voting. The power of democracy is in the active participation of citizens in policy formation and enforcement. There, Christians can agree and say, okay, if you say that Nigeria is a secular country, secular means there is freedom of religion, but there must be no 
uh, patronage of religion by the government. We want our country to be what? Secular. Remove everything religion from our constitution. Let every religion be free to practice what they want to practice, worship what they want to worship, but let this country decide the principles by which we are governed. That is how a nation is built. It's not just by voting. Voting is very important. Do it. But active this. And that's where Christian ministers can come together. We don't like this policy. This policy of using our money to sponsor people to go to Jerusalem or, or, or Mecca. Well, no, we don't want it. We want those money used in infrastructures. Oh, this policy of not knowing whether your country is um, um, a physical federalism or unitary federalism. We don't want it. We want a clear cut. We want a clear-cut system. I know what one we are doing. Oh, we don't want this nonsense. Of every time there's going to be an election, presidential candidate will tell us they don't see their wire result, they don't see this and this. We want a clear-cut law. If you cannot find it and the school where you went, you cannot bring it. Then you are this. The, 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 your laws are ambiguous, full of ambiguity, so that one court will give one judgment here today. Another court in the same case will give a different thing. There is too much ambiguities and ambivalence in your constitution. We are not saying anything about it. We keep making prophecies about who would become um, president tomorrow. I know get strength. <laughs> Honestly, I know get strength. But Christians in Nigeria, urged on by these pulpit bandits, if we don't change the way we are reasoning. Okay, before now, it used to be Crusades only for Christians. When I don't go crusade time, I never change on a situation. Now everybody now is becoming interested in politics. And to show themselves the same people who failed in using crusade to do for you what God has decided to do through government. They are the same people now who are coming to hijack the same thing in the name of prophets. It doesn't work. If Christians want to change Nigeria, it must be in the area of policy formation and implementation. I must be policies that affect everybody positively, irrespective of their religion or their region. We don't want Shisha Elijahs. We have had too much. May God bless you. May He grant you the grace to follow Christ. May He grant you the grace to overcome all temptations as you follow. May He grant you your heart desires. May He grant answers to your prayers. And may God rescue Nigeria from this downward um, turn unto destruction through Jesus Christ our Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, he For the sake of his sorrowful passion